to be moderated by Jordan Hauer, who is co-founder and CEO of Amass Insights, which has one of the largest pipelines of esoteric data streams in the world. He spent the last six years consulting for tech companies to help them monetize proprietary data assets. Previously, he was a lead technologist at a multi-billion dollar longshore equity fund. And I just want to state that Amass has been very helpful in uh, helping us put together these panels. Thank you, Ryan. So I want to start out here with uh, a, a quick informal survey. Um, how many of you would feel confident if I asked you a question, what is alternative data? Raise your hands if you can. OK, so there's a small percentage, I would say. Um, I think, it, for me, it's easiest to actually explain what alternative data is not. Alternative data is not traditional financial market data. Um, it's not you know, SEC filings, stock prices, financial news, anything, the data that's been used for generations in the investment industry. So more specifically, in the, in the asset management industry, alternative data is typically generated in other industries, used for other purposes, and is now being considered to be used in the investment industry. For example, uh, satellite imagery is becoming more ubiquitous and easier to acquire these days, and it's being used in agricultural um, yield uh, predictions. It's being used um, to understand oil storage and supply chains, and um, it's actually been very useful in the investment management industry. As you can tell, alternative data is very varied, um, and it's what's considered alternative actually changes over time. So my company, Amass Insights, uh, created a taxonomy that um, actually has 137 different unique data categories, each with their own use cases. So I'll let my, my panelists, the real world practitioners of alternative data, uh, describe actual, you know, real concrete use cases and ways that they find alpha within these alternative data sets. And I'd, I'd like them to each introduce themselves because, you know, obviously they know themselves better than I do. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, my name is Olga Kokariva. Uh, I oversee data sourcing and strategy for the firm called Constellation. We are a purely quant proprietary trading shop uh, focusing on high frequency trading and mid frequency algorithmic trading uh, across different asset classes and different um, global markets. Uh, before joining Quant Fund, I actually spent uh, about eight years on a traditional hedge fund side. So I have an appreciation on all those challenges uh, traditional hedge funds and their invest investors are going through trying to adopt that idea of this evolution, AI, and alternative data. Uh, hi, my name is Joe Rothermick. I'm at Refinitiv. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Refinitiv is the finance and risk half of Thomson Reuters that split off October 1st to become a new entity. Uh, and I'm part of Refinitiv Labs, so I'm a, a data scientist and I run a, a couple labs that test out new ideas around data or derive data or new products that we could sell. Um, so, you know, a little bit of um, the artificial intelligence and data science type of uh, workflow. Uh, my name is Michael Roberts. Um, I'm the founder of Roberts Capital Advisors. Uh, we're an absolute return manager that uses uh, big data to monitor companies and the economy in real time. Um, I got my career started at T. Rowe Price uh, about 13 years ago, and we were one of the first quantum mental managers, and we turned a two-star fund into a five-star fund in five years using more traditional sources of, of, of data. Um, but to, by sort of seeing where the, seeing the landscape and what was ahead of us, um, we started, uh, scrape, I started scraping data um, as far back as 10 years ago, and we've been uh, managing this strategy using alternative data. Thank you. So I have a good mix here of uh, a, you know, one data vendor and, and a couple of funds. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the alternative data is different for different people. It means different things to different people. Um, and uh, nothing is, it's, it's, it's not more true than be, you know, between uh, Olga and Michael's funds, they use and see alternative data very differently. So I'd love, love if they kind of explained you know, how they you know, see alternative data and you know, how they use it. Uh, to me, alternative data definition is actually slightly different from yours that you gave at the very beginning. I would say alternative data is three things. First, it's non-traditional, unstructured data that hasn't existed a few years ago, such as web traffic or credit card data. Second thing is traditional unstructured data. 
that hedge fund have been hedge funds have been using for years, like new sentiment, like 10 Qs and 10 Ks, um, but extracted from different sources or extracted in, uh, using different methods. And finally, the third thing is structured traditional numerical data that's just being used in a non-traditional way. Because if you think about it, if you use like option markets data to trade equities, that's, that's pretty alternative. Or if you use market structure uh, data, it can be actually used to extract alpha. And the reason I'm focusing on, um, on, on the definition is because there is a misperception in the industry that alternative data is only relevant to quants because they have all these magic computers and just enjoying doing AI and stuff. Um, I don't think that's true. I think a lot of those types of data is actually the same information that hedge funds have been deriving their uh, edge from. The only difference is that at 2018, you cannot really afford to ignore it. Because if you do, then the next guy can get the same information faster or in a more granular manner. And that's where you actually lose your edge. Yeah, well, I don't have very much more to add other, uh, to the definitions that you both gave. Those are great. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll add a little bit on how, how we use it. And um, the way we've used it is sort of the classic example is there's uh, the largest uh, uh, used car retailer in the United States. Um, has about 50,000 cars in their inventory. Uh, we track the year make and model, the price, the MSRP, the location, uh, the interior colors, engine types, all of this very granular information on every single car, on every lot. And then we can literally watch changes in inventory as sale, as um, what, cars leaving a lot, and so we can get the sales in real time. And we're doing that not just for companies, um, but we're doing it for uh, uh, macroeconomic leading indicators um, like housing, uh, which end up being giant data sets. Um, so we can see, and you get much more timely, um, much larger sample size uh, data sets uh, than you'd get from a traditional vendor. And a way you use it is obviously if, um, if you know, Wall Street expectations think uh, sales are going to grow 5%, and you can see that the day that they actually grew 11 to 12 percent, you can buy right before they announce earnings and sell right afterwards. Um, I, I think an even more fundamental way to use it is by, um, by every time that we have a fundamental process and that we impute this, uh, uh, this alternative data into, but um, if we think, uh, we'll set guidelines that we want uh, that our company to hit and uh, we can watch the tailwinds for that company using this alternative data. And that's your own proprietary data set that you scraped online, correct? That, that's right. So, uh, so all of the data that we collect, uh, so all the data we use, we collect internally. So we write the bots uh, that collect the data. We, um, we collect the data into large data sets. Uh, we rent the supercomputers, have the proxy networks, everything you can imagine, um, as well as the econometricians and the fundamental research analysts on staff. Yeah, so uh, as you can see, um, you know, you can, cre you can create your own alternative data sets. You can go to vendors and try to, you know, find alternative data sets. So uh, with that, I want to ask Joe, how does uh, Thompson or Finitive uh, see alternative data? What, what lens do you guys see it through? Um, I, I think that depends on the, the client that we're working with. There's clients of all different levels of sophistication and um, some will want just pure raw data from us. They don't want us to even spend, you know, a day or two looking through the data to test it out. They want it as fast as possible and without any modification from our end. Uh, but maybe they want the contracting or, you know, the, the vendor due diligence kind of stuff taken care of. Um, and then the, the next level of pre-processed data, trying to map it to identifiers or do quality controls and um, trying to locate locations of companies to cell phone activity, you know, stuff like that, that where we could add some value, uh, but still leave it up to the, the, the investor to decide where the actual signal is. Um, and then the third step would be building a quant model. And some, in some cases, we might find something unique. Um, other cases, it's a build versus buy thing for something you just want to have in your process. Or... Um, for a fundamental investor trying to be, be more data-driven. Thank you. Um, and I want to ask Olga, um, can you describe a successful implementation of alternative data and maybe you know, some concrete examples of how you guys found alpha? 
well, I cannot really get into <laughs> that much of a, a detail on how we find alpha. Uh, so, but our, our process, I would say, it's typical for quants, and it's very different from how uh, traditional fundamental hedge fund managers would be using alternative data. So the way we use data is we actually heavily focusing on, uh, it's like it's, it's at a core of our investment strategy. So we overlay a lot of different data sets, and we use machine learning algorithm to extract alpha from this data. And we prefer, for that reason, we prefer uh, multi-dimensional data sets with a lot of different uncorrelated signals. Um, and also for that reason, we absolutely, like, like all other quants as well, we absolutely need the um, historical data available to backtest and to sometimes we even derive the investment thesis from analyzing data rather than just applying uh, investment thesis that we came up with. Uh, with fundamental managers, that would be completely different. They mostly use uh, alternative data to reinforce their investment thesis. For example, if they are thinking about closing the position or opening the position and instead of waiting for the next uh, report, they can use alternative data for that. And uh, speaking of use cases, um, as I said, it's, uh, it's hard to talk about use cases in, in, the ca in case of quants because it's just basically analyzing huge amounts of data and multidimensional data sets. For uh, fundamentals, definitely, uh, for example, if it's a retailer, you can look at credit card spendings, you can look at food traffic, pretty classical example. Um, you can judge um, about sales in car industry, um, automobile industry uh, by looking at uh, sales of insurance. Um, I even heard about a couple of interesting um, use cases in a private equity space. A private equity company actually were, they were monitoring uh, development side using satellite images. That's how they knew that the factory is actually built, being built. Um, another interesting example from the wealth management industry where um, a wealth manager actually scraped publicly available data to build their own index of how um, U.S. families invest, and so they could allow their clients to compare themselves with, uh, with that index. So th those are all uh, uh, use cases of alternative data, and there are obviously like endless other use cases you can think of. I think Olga brings up a good point. Um, quants. Uh, and fundamentals look at alternative data very differently, um, and there's even a mix now, which is another buzzword called quantum mental. Um, and we, we often see that fundamental investors uh, want to, re as, you, as you mentioned, reinforce their ideas. They also want to answer specific questions that they are, you know, looking to, um, you know, to understand a company, you know, in, in a deeper way. Um, is there is there an example, uh, Michael, um, where where you, um, you know? Thought, thought of a question that you wanted to answer, thought of scraping the internet, and were able to answer that question. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I think one of the big uh, questions right now is what's happening with housing. Um, so we collect, uh, so while Kay Schiller looks at uh, uh, just pricing uh, for you know, 10 cities or 20 cities around the United States, uh, we're actually looking at over 50% of the housing stock, and therefore over 50% of sales, and so we're trying to put together um, the Case Shiller Index in real time, and um, it was, that's been particularly important for. Uh, so we own um, uh, one of the largest uh, wholesale uh, distri wholesale uh, distri pool distributors in the United States. And what's been very important for the, for them is their their um, industry tailwinds, and they primarily uh, they primarily sell products uh, within the southern part of the United States and people tend to build homes when they buy a new home. And so as that housing, as uh, there's been strength in the southern part of the United States, um, the stock's done really, really well. Uh, not just because they're taking out their competitors, but because they're really strong tailwinds. And, um, and Joe, so uh, you guys obviously um, integrate, you know, gather uh, a lot of data, a lot of different types of data. Um, what's important to you uh, and to your company um, when deciding which data sets to, to gather and to provide to your clients? I, I think the traditional answer would have been coverage and amount of history and, you know, or is it covering a lot of companies or just a, an economic sector and so on. 
Um, it used to be 10,000 companies and 10 years history was the minimum to have the conversation. And I think people have started to back off on that because there are these alternative data sets that have new opportunities that um, otherwise you would just miss out on. Um, and then also in terms of just sheer coverage, you can have a very small scope I mean, it might not work for a um, quant equity strategy where you're trying to invest in a lot of companies, but for a fundamental investor, it might be very useful still to look at a, a small number of companies that you're covering. Um, but then, you know, also data quality, correlation, um, is there a signal there? All that kind of stuff is the typical stuff we would go through. But more and more importantly, I think we're getting asked about the vendors, where, like where we're getting the data from and what's the provenance of the data. Is it um, taken without the terms of agreement? You know, like if you're scraping a website that you don't have the access rights to or if, um, if there's some other things about the data that contain personal identifiable information, you know, things like that where you can get into trouble. So they want us to, to manage that part of it. And then also, is the vendor still gonna be around? Um, you know, I mean, we're, we're a big business and we've been around for a long time, but we're buying data from companies that are just now starting to put their data out there and stuff. So, you know, what's the uh, reliability of the vendor from that perspective? And that brings me to my, to my next point. Um, so, the, obviously, uh, uh, funds and even data providers are gathering and monetizing and, and uh, partnering with several different data providers. Um, and, you know, I think it's, what's really important is to build a process uh, around that. So, I know Olga has a, a pretty uh, uh, unique and, um, and profitable process. So, I'd like her to speak to maybe some best practices and maybe common mistakes that you see um, we either vendors or funds are making uh, in this process of integrating uh, alternative data? I think the single best practice is to start with a deep understanding of your data needs. And the biggest mistakes uh, funds and managers and data buyers can make is just starting going out there and buying like whatever they can find. Um, I think the important thing is to understand what are you looking for that's how you understand where you can get it from. And then you have to make sure that you have internal capabilities or external advisors to help you actually use this data. That's how you keep your uh, cost at a reasonable level, level, and that's how you actually take advantage of using alternative data. Great, thanks. Um, so how does, uh, let me ask you this as well. Um, how does one source an alternative data set? Uh, that's an interesting question. When I just started doing that, I remember there was almost no information whatsoever. It was so hard to even find data vendors and to even understand what's available out there. And um, the value added of people like myself, like data scouts, was just merely was just uh, their uh, network of vendors and just their understanding of the products available. Now it is completely the opposite. There are so many data vendors out there and so many data products that the hardest thing is to actually uh, evaluate them and find what is relevant to your strategy and also uh, what data is actually of a high enough quality for you to use. Um, so I think that uh, a lot of people actually talk about the risk of overcrowding and as more people using the same alternative data, the data is becoming less alternative and more commoditized, and it's just too expensive for that. So I think the trend is towards finding edge, not in the fact that you know where to take the data from or you have access to this data, but actually how do you use this data. When, and in the early days of alternative data industry, it was primarily raw data used by primar primarily by quants, which makes sense because we have internal capabilities to build features and to extract alpha. Now the trend is mostly on the vendor side, uh, pre-calculated statistics, ready to use signals, dashboards for uh, discretionary managers to use. But I feel like um, that's my prediction that in the future, uh, investment managers will start taking back control over feature selection and feature engineering process because basically that's how you differentiate yourself and you can actually extract uh, a different uh, signal from uh, alpha that's available to other people as well. Yeah, I, I think that um, in terms of, uh, you know, the raw data versus um, analyzed stuff is, um, 
it, you know, it depends on how you use it. And, and it's just like factor crowding. You know, a lot of people do factor-based investing and some of these factors have been around for a long time and they still have some value, um, supposedly. Um, so, you know, part of it is, is that you're not depending on a single data set and the one signal that that gives you, but it's how you incorporate it into a broader investment process. And everybody can do that in a different way, even if you're all using the exact same signal. Um, but otherwise, I think it, yeah, it's better to have something built up with your own slice of um, different ingredients or decisions about how to apply things. And um, yeah. So I'm going to pause there for a minute and see if there's any audience questions. I'll repeat your question. Yeah, no worries. Um, so this is actually to Joe, and I think he uh, brings up a really good point you know, around uh, the commercial viability and compliance checks that you guys have run. Um, my question to you is, proportionally, how many of those vendors don't pass your test? So let me just repeat that so that the, the video can hear. Um, so uh, the question was for Joe, and how, man, how many uh, vendors don't pass the compliance process? Yeah, I mean, it, we do review a lot of data, and probably 75, 90% of the data we, we reject as either not following you know, good compliance or good quality controls and, or just reliability standpoint, um, or just doesn't look like interesting signal at all and, and doesn't give enough history or you know, something like that. So it's a very small percentage that actually moves forward. Okay, so uh, the next thing I'd like to ask is um, a little bit more about do's and don'ts um, with using alternative data. Um, one of the things is, that we see is, you know, people uh, definitely uh, are using all sorts of different types of alternative data. They see it in different ways, as we talked about. Um, but, uh, and they might be finding alpha today, and six months from now, they might find that, that alpha that they found is, you know, no longer there. Um, so, uh, for Michael, um, when you find you know a profitable data set that you're collecting or you're analyzing, uh, how do you maintain that ROI? Don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's actually true. Uh, it, it's it's very very hard because there's a lot of um, people like to believe that you get these incredible data feeds and they stream into these machines that make alpha on every single trade, and it's just not how it works. Um, so, it, it, in fact, the, instead, it's, it's, it's a very, very laborious process. Um, it, it requires a lot of thought, um, a lot of time scraping data, um, and then ultimately seeing whether it works. And so, um, uh, yeah, it's, 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 I guess the, the way to, to, to keep, um, it, 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 the first thing is to keep it secret. Um, but but the, the second thing to do is uh, you really have to keep a lot of controls around how you collect it, and um, and you have to keep incredible records of when you're you know when you're gathering the data, who gathered it, what systems would they use, what software, what hardware, everything, because as soon as that and that will change um, over time, that you can actually go back and look through that data and. Um, take a look at what the changes were and whether those changes had any impacts on the data. So it's really, it's a matter of being dynamic um, and, but also being thoughtful about how you document things. And, and I think that, um, you know, obviously if you have your own data in-house somehow that, you know, some view of uh, customer activity or something that can tell you something about the market overall and, uh, you know, obviously that's the best way to keep things private. Um, but the other thing is, you know, just monitoring it over time, the performance. People talk about alpha decay, um, but that can happen for a variety of reasons, not just crowding, but also the underlying artifacts about how the data is collected or how the data is being used can change over time. Um, you know, and there's just as simple as if people are using less apps on their phone or, you know, the... the um, the way that they use their phone changes over time. That can affect the trends so that if you're looking at footfall, it might not be decreasing footfall, but just the way that you know, the data is collecting can change. 
Yeah, and, and we, we also see that uh, there's, there are issues with vendors that maybe change their uh, collection processes over time, don't really tell you, um, or maybe they, they don't really understand their own collection processes. Um, and, and, you know, the, uh, going through that process with them um, is sometimes painful because uh, you might not find out exactly what you're up against until you've already sunk a lot of time and effort uh, into analyzing that data set. Um, are there any automated or um, you know quicker ways that you found Olga to you know combat that process and and to you know fast track uh, sourcing a data set? Well, our research process is fully automated, and we use machine learning algorithm, and it helps us to find those data quality issues in the historical data. But you're absolutely right; there's a big issue. And I think the reason for that problem that you just mentioned is because a lot of data vendors, they are great at data, but they don't really understand financial market well enough, and they don't really appreciate how important this consistency is. And so this is to uh, your point on how do you make sure that you sustain that ROI is like for equity, uh, actively traded strategy for like frequently traded strategy like ours, it's uh, definitely um, delivery schedule and update schedule and consistencies that in, in methodology is super important. Um, so yeah, so we, it doesn't really, like the process definitely does help deal with this issue. So we, at least we can uh, catch this once it happens. Still the problem because it takes a, uh, takes a while to work with vendor and make sure it's uh, back to the consistent. And to add to your previous question, um, one way to maintain this ROI, I think, as I mentioned, um, is the feature engineering process, uh, which is in-house, because that's how you recycle the data set when you bring new data sets on board. Uh, so I think for uh, for managers who are just starting using alternative data, it probably makes sense to work with like third-party providers to help them do that, uh, to help them like audit their data library, if you will, and find new um, applications to the data they already have in-house and they're bringing in-house. And um, this, this question, I'm, I'm happy for any of the three of you guys to take. Um, how do you differentiate your firm from others that may be using the same alternative data sets, maybe scraping the same data, maybe working with the same vendors? I, I think in alternative data, the devil's in the details. And so no one's going to have uh, the same exact data sets um, day to day, uh, even minute to minute. Um, so, it, particularly, unless you're all getting it from the same data provider, in which case it, you will. So, um, but if you're getting, um, if you're actually scraping it yourself, um, there's a lot of variability. Uh, and you, are you, uh, what time of day are you doing it? What kind of, you know, data, what, what, what kinds of controls do you have around, um, uh, around collecting it and analyzing it? What kinds of computers, what kind of hardware are you using to actually, um, to, to, to propel uh, the algorithm? So, uh, so there's a lot more differentiation and variability and I, you know, dare I say art, uh, to this process, and that's you know whether it's sort of the old style quantumental where you take you know the fundamental uh, the fundamental 10k and 10q data, um, and everyone runs the same back tests and gets similar results. Um, but even there, the devil is in the details. You know, do you create sector models? Do you run the same models within every sector? What what kind of factors do you want to use? What kind of investment horizon do you have? There's so many different um, uh, there's so many different variables that you have to answer, that, it, um, that I think people will come up with different answers and use it in different ways in their investment processes. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, um, you know, forget about point in time type of issues and the, the time scales and all that stuff when you're dealing with alternative data because it's just this, this uh, there's so much work to just get it structured to begin with, but uh, there's a lot of issues that can come along from that. And then I think for, connecting For the less uh, data inclined, what do you mean by point in time? Uh, so that the data matches, you know, um, if somebody released an earnings, uh, you know, result, for example, and then went into the revision, you get what the original thing was on that date. So if you're doing a back test through time, you would have like what you would have seen then. And you would have had it mapped to an organizational hierarchy that was relevant at that point too, because the organizational hierarchies change over time and that can be really tricky. 
Um, so yeah, I think that that's really important, but also just um, thinking about um, how to connect the data to traditional data as well, and making sure that there's the, uh, the ability to, to mesh in all this alternative and traditional data and organizational data, um, kind of all in a, this big knowledge graph is really important. Um, I'd like to pause again for, for, for questions. Just to repeat, um, the question is, is about how, uh, when you're sourcing an alternative data set, uh, how much time in the process is devoted to each different task? For example, is 90% of it data cleaning? Yeah, I think I'll take this one because it's, it's a huge pain for us. It definitely takes uh, too much efforts to clean and to make, this data, make the data sets actually usable. Uh, I think one way to deal with that is to uh, hire uh, like a third party firm. Uh, there are a few of those out there now uh, who help with that because a lot of times, especially when you work with new data vendors who haven't really sold to hedge funds a lot, like they don't even know that the data is supposed to be mapped. Uh, they've never heard about point in time. They don't care about timestamps uh, and all these things. Definitely a lot of times we just need to like drop the, um, uh, the data set and just put it on hold for a couple of years before the vendor really come, uh, understands how to productize it. Uh, but a lot of times if, you, if we actually see the value in this data set, we are willing to work with, uh, with a vendor and to actually explain them what exactly we're looking for. And some vendors, they're actually pretty good and you know, taking the feedback and working with their data to make it usable. But to your point, you're absolutely right. It's, it's still not there. It takes too much time. Yeah, they, they say that 80% of a data scientist's time is janitorial work, and I, I agree with that. And we find um, that the more valuable or the, the vendors that are able to get a higher price uh, when selling their data set are the ones that are a little bit more uh, set, you know, set in stone, don't have to do as much of this data cleaning uh, work um, on the, vent, on the uh, fund side rather than you know, on, the, on the data provider side. So um, you know, that, that, that's an important thing for a vendor to understand is the more work you, your work you can do on it, you likely could uh, potentially charge a higher price for that, for that data set. Um, so uh, I'd like to go into a little bit about um, actually integrating a data set into an investment process. Uh, obviously, it's very different for different funds. Um, we have two funds up here, so uh, I'd like you guys to speak to that. Okay, um, so, I, so integrating a data set into a... Um, so once, once you've kind of collected the data, cleaned it, even yeah. potentially analyzed it, how do you integrate that into your process? Um, well, I, th I think it's important to keep everything in perspective, yeah, first of all, and you sort of over, don't overstate what you have. And so, um, so for example, let's suppose you have um, a, a good revenue estimate for a company, and it's very different from what the rest of what Wall Street expectations. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of danger in just making a bet on that one number, because it's one number on one, uh, on one financial statement of many numbers on financial statements and of a lot of things that can go wrong in a quarter if, it, if, if you think that there's revenue is going to be a lot higher than Wall Street estimates. Um, and so I think it, so you have to be really honest with yourself on what you have. Um, it, and I think as you start stepping away from that model where you actually have price and quantity for a company, uh, but instead you start monitoring industry tailwinds, Again, keep that in perspective of, of the overall information set uh, that you have. And so it's really great data. It's probably better data than most people have. But um, you are trying to estimate just a couple numbers. And you need to process those numbers within uh, what we believe a, a broad fundamental framework. Well, good. Uh, do you have a different view than that? 
Uh, yeah, to us it's slightly different only because our research process is, uh, is very different. And so to us it's mostly about the process and mostly about the data more than about investment hypothesis. Uh, we actually, from the implementation standpoint, uh, by the time we, we evaluated a uh, data set, we sort of partially integrated it because that's how we run back tests. And so to us, uh, once we go live, the important part is what we already talked about, that consistency from the vendor side. So we monitor that. We keep working with vendor to see if they can improve their uh, delivery process, if they can make the data um, delivered more frequently or make it more granular uh, and just make sure they don't do it without telling us. Um, so this is what, um, what's important for us and obviously monitoring alpha decay because alpha decay is still real like no matter how hard you try to uh, keep that, that edge. Uh, and once data set is not really performing, uh, maybe it makes sense to, to drop it or to combine it with something else. So for us it's, it's mostly that. Are the investment decisions that you guys are making with this data, is, are they fairly automated? They are automated, yeah. And I think the, the difference here is Michael uh, is looking at things, uh, you know, not necessarily in an automated way. That's correct. Yeah, it's more discretionary and fundamental. Yeah, and so I think uh, as a summary here, I think um, you know, Michael's got, I, I would call it more of a quantum mental fund. Yes. Um, maybe, you know, more fundamental in nature than than, uh, than, than quanti quantitative in nature. Um, and, and Olga, uh, you know, more of a quantitative uh, view. Um, and, uh, and Joe, um, how, do, how do you see the differences between working with fundamental and quantitative uh, hedge funds? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what they're trying to do with the data. Like I was saying before, sometimes it can be a smaller coverage if it's a quantum mental, I mean, a quantum mental yeah, um, type of investor. Um, and they want things more processed and, and so on, and, and it's a different type of use case, I think. Um, but, uh, and, and I think the, the value of a certain thing can change depending on if it's quant or, or more fundamentally oriented. You were talking about how, you know, don't rely on a certain one piece of data to make some decision, um, but I think also you shouldn't necessarily dismiss something if it doesn't have a direct signal related to it, kind of like you could you know, sentiment is really hard to trade on, uh, but sentiment combined with some estimate of earnings can be more powerful than just that estimate itself. So I think the fundamental, quantum mental type of investor can kind of take those things into account and, and incorporate that into their process. I'd like to, to add uh, to that a little bit. We are like quants, we are definitely uh, much bigger pain for vendors than uh, <laughs> fundamental discretionary funds. Uh, but there's a flip side of it. I think it's, it's uh, rather beneficial for vendors to work with quants who are willing to uh, provide feedback and to help vendors. I think it's a two-way street. And a lot of times we go back to the vendor and help them enhance and improve their product. So it's mutually beneficial. Yeah, and if I could just say, uh, I didn't mean to come off the wrong way. I, the, the data is, it's been, they're great data points. Um, I, would, I, I guess the, the uh, what I didn't want to convey is that they're not the only data points. Um, so, yeah, that's it. I think that's probably true of any fund. Uh, traditional financial market data is the underpinning to pretty much any investment decision. So, with that, uh, thank you guys, and um, ha uh, have a great day. Yeah.